Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 13 say this, And God spake unto Noah, and to his sons with him, saying, And behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And what I'm going to speak on today is the focus is in verse 13 there, where it says, I do set my bow in the cloud. And the topic I'm going to speak on today is reclaiming the rainbow. Now, what's being described here is God is talking about how this is at right after he had destroyed most of the human population due to their sin, and he only saved Noah and his family because Noah was righteous and believed God and preached the gospel. And what he's telling Noah when he gets off the ark is he's going to set his rainbow, or he's going to set his bow in the cloud, and that is going to be a token of his covenant that he's no longer going to destroy the human population with a flood like he did back then. Now, the very first time a rainbow is mentioned in the Bible, it's mentioned as a good thing. It's mentioned as a covenant between God and man, and this covenant is that right after God had just got done judging the earth, that he was going to show his mercy, and he was not going to destroy the entire human population with the flood anymore. That is what the original representation and meaning of the rainbow symbol is. And sadly today, members of Christ-rejecting gay communities and Christ-rejecting LGBT or whatever you want to call it have taken this symbol and have tried to pervert it and use it as a sign of sexual permissiveness, use it as a sign of there's no right and wrong, there's no judgment, just do whatever you want, taking pride in living the way that God says you should not live over and over again in Leviticus chapter 20 in Romans chapter 1. And unfortunately, whenever we see this flag, whenever we see a, a flag that represents a rainbow, we immediately get uncomfortable as Christians because we know about the sin that it's being used to represent. But I'm here to tell you today, I believe that we as Christians should reclaim the rainbow because that is a symbol that belongs to our God. That is a symbol of God's judgment because he had just got done destroying most of the human population. And it's a sign of his mercy because he's not going to send another flood to wipe out the human population like he did back then. And so the flood represents both God's judgment and his mercy because he saved some, that being Noah and his family. Likewise, the rainbow that came after the flood also represents God's judgment and God's mercy. People like to use the rainbow to represent nothing but permissiveness, and it's not about sexual permissiveness. In fact, go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and look at what it says in verses 4 through 9. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, and condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those afterward that should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for a right, for that a righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So what we see here in Second Peter chapter 2 is that God is drawing a parallel between what happened in Noah's flood 
and what happened in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's mentioning both of those as part of the same overall point. And he comes to that overall point in verse 9 where it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And so what you see here is God's delivering the godly, God is delivering the righteous, God is delivering believers, but at the same time, he's punishing the unjust. So God is showing mercy, but at the same time, God is showing judgment. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians who like to, you know, be friendly towards homosexuality, even though the Bible calls it an abomination, a lot of those people like to say, well, God is just love and God is just mercy. Well, no, God is both love and God is judgment. And if you look at verse 9, it says who God shows mercy to, and it says who God shows judgment to. It says the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. You see, if you're not godly, if, you're, if you don't believe in the gospel, if you're living a Christ-rejecting life, if you're living a homosexual life, you don't fit in the category of godly, and therefore you're not going to be a recipient of of God's mercy, and you're not going to be a recipient of God's deliverance. It's just that straightforward. Meanwhile, it says, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And so the if you're unjust, if you're Christ-rejecting, living that homosexual lifestyle, doing those things for which God either destroyed the human population in the flood or destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, then that's in the category of unjust, and that's going to be punished by God. That person is not going to be someone whom God shows love or mercy to, just justice and punishment. And that is why, if you go back here, it says that in verse 5, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. It says it saved Noah the eighth person. The reason it's saying that is because only eight people were saved in the flood. Noah and his wife, and then Noah's three sons, with each of them with their wives, that totals to eight people. So the entire human population, likely thousands and thousands of people were on the earth. Only eight people, arguably, I, we know for a fact Noah was a believer, but at most only eight people were godly at this time. And what happens as a result? God destroys the entire population that's wicked and saves only eight people who are going to go out and do God's will afterwards. And you see, this is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that even if righteousness is unpopular, righteousness is still righteousness and wrong is still wrong. You see, because homosexuality is becoming more culturally accepted in today's generation, a lot of people like to say, well, maybe we as the church should just relax our standard because sin is becoming more popular. Did God relax his standard then? No. Noah was very unpopular. He was one of maybe only eight righteous people left on the planet, and God destroyed those thousands and saved Noah and his family. And if you go to Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham pleaded on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah because he knew Lot lived there. Remember, he said, he, he said to God, if you find 10 righteous people, if you find 20 righteous people, will you spare this city? And what happens? God didn't even find that many righteous people. He still destroyed it anyway. It says, verse 8, for the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unrighteous, with their unlawful deeds. That's talking about how Lot was constantly aggravated and constantly in pain, seeing how sinful and unrighteous the Sodomites were living in their homosexuality. That's why he told them, do not so wickedly. But what happened? Doing the right thing, which is what Lot was trying to do, though he wasn't perfect at it, living righteously was not popular. Meanwhile, living in sin became popular. God did not chill out and relax his holy standards in order to please those who were living filthy. Nope. He punished the sinful majority, and he saved the righteous minority. That's what happened in the flood. He punished the sinful majority and saved the righteous minority, and that is how God operates. God does not conform to sin just because it's popular. That is the real message of the rainbow. If you want to taste the rainbow, then taste that. God will deliver the godly, and God will punish the unjust. And so that is what our rainbow truly ought to represent. So we as Christians, 
need to reclaim this symbol for ourselves and we need to reclaim it in the name of our God and we need to understand that that rainbow is something God put in place to show that he had delivered the just which was Noah and his family and chose to punish the unrighteous which is the rest of the world and so unfortunately all these Christ rejecting homosexuals walking around with this gay flag you know the president's throwing up a gay monument or whatever it is that he's doing all of this with this rainbow flag, that's actually representing the God that's going to judge them. That's not representing the sexual permissiveness that they think it represents. And so we as Christians need to reclaim that symbol. And I even come up with some interesting ideas. Again, these are just prototypes. Uh, these are just, these ideas aren't perfect, but I think that these would really get the message. We need to get some t-shirts. And here they are. So as you can see here, we have some t-shirts that have different scriptures on them. And basically the idea here is reclaim the rainbow. And I really hope if there's a Christian t-shirt maker out there, you get these made. Even if you change the color palette a bit or, you know, improve it in some way, we as Christians need to get the message out that rainbow belongs to our God, not to those Christ rejecting anti-godly sodomite people and that's what we need to do you can even put whatever scriptures are relevant to the subject matter you know my favorite one would be second peter 2 9 because that's really the big picture of what the rainbow represents but here's another possible design that uses uh, matthew 19 where jesus talks about that marriage is between a man or a woman or if you really want to up the ante, and this is one I would still wear, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, that talks about how homosexuality is an abomination and is something that God hates and is worthy of death, just like it teaches in Romans 1, 32. And so th these are the kinds of things I would wear. People say, oh, well, Leviticus 20, 13 is too mean. It's too extreme. Well, no, every word of God is pure. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Even the words that seem tough, that seem harsh, it's still holy because it comes from God. And we as Christians need to reclaim the rainbow and not be afraid of what God's word teaches. So even if this video gets taken down because, you know, some gay person doesn't like it, what I'm going to do is upload this video as Creative Commons. I hope you're able to download the video. I hope you're able to mirror the video and maybe copy it on your channel and really get the word out there because I think this is a very important campaign point for we Christians to rally around because at the end of the day our God is the judge this is our God symbol the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust to the of judgment to be punished and so that's what we need to understand that God is going to spare his faithful and condemn his detractors God bless.